Jericho. They walked around. They went around the, the city. They yelled. They marched. If God could have just tore that place down immediately, right? How many believe that? God could tear down many things, walls in our lives too. But sometimes we have to do things. And the children of Israel had to walk around that building. And so um, I'm not telling you you have to get out of your spirit, you know, out of what you normally do. But do things that that bring us to a closer walk with, with God. Make it, it is an action. And whatever you need to do to do that. Put your body under submission, as the Bible says. Just uh, let, let God work in your life, whatever it takes to do that. And sometimes humbling ourselves by by bouncing a little bit, or stepping, or clapping, or singing, or opening our mouth, and wording. You know, you don't have to sing out loud. Just move your lips. Whatever. So God moves through those things that we do. How many believe that? Yes. So if you have a need this morning, I know we don't have a lot of time, we got a lot of things going on, but if I would have, I think if God is calling you to come forward, there's a lot of people in need, a lot of people hurting, come forward and pray for them. If you need help or need prayer, just come forward and, and uh, let, let our prayer partners pray with you this morning.
to step forward for the serving of communion. And as they're coming forward, please be seated. Uh, we invite any and every person to receive this. Uh, the reason we do this, the reason we take part in this, is because we've been instructed to. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, Take this. Take this as Jesus, Jesus put it. Do this in remembrance of me. But Paul says further, remember his death. I and mean, we remember his life, right? That's the fun part. <laughs> but we forget. Yeah. We forget that somebody went to the cross for me. <laughs> and you. We want the life. We just don't want to struggle to get there. But isn't it a beautiful statement that Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if this cup can be taken from me, but not my will, but thine be done. And he went to the distance. Amen. That's why we take this. So it's not meant to be taken lightly. It's not meant to be taken passively. It's meant to be taken intentionally, remembering the work that Jesus Christ has done to bring salvation to us, to all men.
raised the bread up and gave thanks. And this, this body which is broken for you to take and do. Let us give thanks for this bread. Thank you, Father in heaven, for the bread, the bread of life. The bread that's been broken for us. And as we eat of this, we are reminded of our Lord and Savior. for the harshness of what happened to him, and yet the glory bestowed upon him. As we take and eat of this, let us be reminded of that brokenness and the hope. In Jesus' name, let us eat. Jesus, 
was dedicated by his parents. And the pre presenting of children in dedication is a serious matter. It involves responsibilities with which uh, will be charged and responsibility which God has promised to take upon himself, uh, which is uh, to each child placed in his care. And so parents, Jake and Allie, I'm going to say Colton, <laughs> Josh and Sam, this is for each of you. I'm going to read off some char charges to you. And at the end, if you are willing, say we will. I will. Excuse me. Parents, the first responsibility is yours. I love that sentence. Sorry, I'm starting to get preachy. What a statement. Before God, to whom you bring your child for dedication, I charge each of you that you live an exemplary life before the child, that your child, made by example, know what it is to be a Christian. That you make your home a school where they shall receive Christian instruction. That you shall see that they are, they are taken to church for additional instruction. That you shall pray for their salvation when they reach that age of accountability. And that you shall uh, endeavor to lead them to Christ. If you are willing to accept this charge, answer, I will. Congregation, please stand with us. Because you are not alone in this. We are here. We are here. The church which, through its minister, accepts a child in dedication, assumes a responsibility before God, and in view of this responsibility, I charge each of you in the presence here that you will do all that you can do to provide and support a place of worship and instruction in this community where this child, should these children, should they continue to live here, may hear the full counsel of God's word. That you will all come in together to set an example by your lives and to maintain an atmosphere in your church which shall inspire these children to desire the Christian way of life. That as God shall remind you, you shall pray for their salvation. Those of you who are willing to accept this charge, please answer with God's help, we will. You may be seated. Thank you. On the authority of God's holy word and as a minister of church, uh, Christ Church, I affirm that if we faithfully keep our pledges to God, God will keep His. And those being that through the Holy Spirit will convict your child of the sin that as they come to the age of accountability. That God will make the love of Christ, His Son, known to them. God will bless and guide His child through all their Christian life. And with that, there's going to be a what we it's a representation of them giving this child over to God. We anoint these children, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, to be sealed by the Spirit to the age of accountability, and when they so choose, that the Holy Spirit seals them in that decision in salvation. But there's one last act. Leanna, she's content. Coulter, this might be a hard one for you. But there's a representation of uh, a minister an elder in the church to take that child from the parents' hands. It's the it's representation of the parents saying, Father God, this is your child. Help us to keep it in your hands. And so I've asked Steve if you take Leanne, I'll take Coulter. Or you can just say a quick prayer, Coulter, okay? 
as quick as you let me. And in doing that, yes, we'll pray for the parents, lay hands on can you stop it? Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. For Leanna, we pray your hand upon her life. For Colton, your hand upon his life. As an act of, of these parents, Jake and Emma, Josh and Sam, Lord, in their willingness to, to return this child in your hands, for your work to be in him, Lord, bless these children. Cause them to come know you at an early age. sums it up. <laughs> but we do have a, a gift uh, for Coulter and for Leanne. We've got a Bible for them. But we also want you to take these flowers with you. Uh, the, the flowers represent uh, the red carnation is the uh, in the incarnations, they, they don't lose their petals. They, the petals continuously stay there. So there's that forever love, that forever connection to the children. No matter what their children do, there's still this deep love for them. But for the red one, it's that blood connection that, that uh, Josh and Jane have with their child. It represents that, that connection that you have with them. And in blood, there's life. That's the life-giving thing in our body, right? You guys get to give life. <laughs> Be those men. Be those men. The white carnation is that is the purity, the beautiful purity of a woman of God. You are those women. You are that woman. You are that woman. It's a sign of nurturing. It's the, the connection you continue to nurture. You get to show the your child, Leanna. You get to show Colton the nurturing side of God the Father. It's a beautiful thing. And then the rose. Little Liana. Colton. Just that budding rose, that aroma of life coming forth, that at an early age, again, that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that as they come to know, that they see Christ in each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. So again, blessings upon each of you. Colter. Okay? Leanne, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Josh and Sam. Thank you, Jake and Alice, for making this commitment publicly. And I hope you heard us say we're with you in this. Blessings to you. Thank you. You may be seated.
time, we can start to have fun now. So if you make your way back to your seats. But with that, hey, we're going to continue in worship. Uh, before we get into the worship of hearing God's word, uh, the men who come forward uh, for the giving of that first portion that God's laid upon your heart to give. Um, and uh, I am not preaching on giving this week. Uh, it's not where I, I find us in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. So let's give thanks. Father, I thank you for every, each and every opportunity uh, to return unto you that portion that you laid upon our hearts to give out of the, the gratefulness and, and out of the goodness of you, Lord, for your soul, glorious and wonderful. Thank you for supplying our need. Thank you for giving us health and strength as we need it. Get to, get to work and do the things that you, you have fashioned us to do. But Lord, as we give now, we, we know that you multiply what is given to your honor and glory. To you be the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Dedications. Sometimes a baby cries, but our pastor always cries. <laughs> We've got Gospel Marketplace tonight, 7 o'clock. We've got a new speaker. She's never spoke before, Patty Horn. And um, got a few more coming up. Uh, Jim Henson's coming next week, and uh, Randy Kennedy after that. So we got some uh, really good speakers coming up. That's at 7 o'clock tonight. This week, we've got uh, Tuesday morning, the Riverside Bible Study. Uh, Wednesday is our big night here at Casino. Youth will be back. A lot of happening here. Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. As far as I know, this is the only casino in the world that shuts down everything for prayer. <laughs> so, I wish they were all that way. Uh, come on out to that. If you, uh, the doors will be open. So, National Day of Prayer. Friday, Homeschool Support Group, 10 o'clock. And uh, also there's an opportunity here. Um, we're supporting uh, Larray and Joe as they go through this. And there's going to be a, a fundraiser. Um, there's a note here. If you want to make a basket that will be raffled off at the fundraiser on May 18th, Talk to Karen, talk to Sue, and uh, that's something, uh, there's many ways we can help, and that's one of them. Six o'clock to eight o'clock next week on Wednesday is the spring cleanup. Not all work. There's also pizza coming at six o'clock, so come early, a week from Wednesday night, and uh, get in on that. Also, a garage sale fundraiser for a casino child care center uh, down at bottom shelves anyway. Lots of different other opportunities. Basketball camp is coming up. Um, you can help the youth get to their missions destination by hiring them for spring cleaning or anything. Two hour time slots. So lots of opportunities coming up. Glad you're involved. Hey, we are in 2nd Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, working our way through Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, his second letter there. Um, again, just uh, offering direction and, and instruction for the body of Christ, uh, offering um, a rebuke if the rebuke is needed, uh, and reminders. This is who the body of Christ is. And so today we're going to, uh, I'm going to emphasize in, in chapter 10 here, talks about uh, spiritual warfare, uh, that we are in a spiritual battle, that we're in a spiritual war. Um, I'm not going to go greatly in depth, but it is going to be a reminder uh, for us that this world is not our home, amen? That's what my Shakai says, just to remind you. Um, and that even in living in this time, in this physical sense, it's there's still the spiritual reality going on around us. 
Okay? And I think we lose sight of that a lot of times. You listen to politics, you listen to people who debate politics, what do they emphasize? They emphasize economy, they emphasize uh, you know, uh, uh, pro-Hamas or uh, pro-Israel. They, they, they have these arguments about these things that are going on in the world. And they have no clue what's really the battle that's going on in the world. It's a battle for truth. It's a battle for righteousness. It's a battle uh, for holiness. And the, but those that don't have Christ, those that don't have a uh, uh, in it in them in them to recognize that there is a God, that there is if there is a God, then there must be an absolute truth, and go after that absolute truth. No, let's destroy God so we can be our own gods. They have no clue. And I'm not being offensive to anybody. I'm just saying they aren't aware. They're deceived. They're in darkness. They're, they have blinders on. They, they don't know. But as we walk in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know. But I think sometimes we forget. Okay? And I'm not saying let's look for a demon behind every little bush. I'm, I'm not going to say that. I'm not even going to imply that. But I do think as, as we look at this, Paul is reminding us, hey, there's a spiritual battle going on. There's a spiritual battle that's going on, and we have been enlisted to that battle. Okay? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you uh, for Paul and his, uh, your anointing on his life in, in giving us this, uh, the instruction and the direction uh, for the church. Lord, as we look at this now, may, may the words that I say be clear and concise. May they be encouraging. May they be challenging. May they be that by your spirit there comes a conviction upon each and every heart. Um, Lord, that we are engaged as we ought to be. Father, but as, as we go through this again, may those that don't know you come to know you. And those that do know you continue to grow in that relationship, I ask. Jesus name. Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10 verse 1. Now I Paul myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence am lowly among you but being absent and bold and bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present that I may uh, that I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to Hold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Uh, in, in that point, um, do we walk in the flesh today? It's a trick question. As a believer in Jesus Christ, no, we're not supposed to walk in the flesh. But realistically, we're, we're, we're physical beings, aren't we? And, and even as a follower of Jesus Christ, that which I thought I crucified and identified in Christ Jesus in in Dying in Christ Jesus and being raised in Christ Jesus, sometimes that flesh, that that this body of mine takes and, and says, hey, I want to do that evil that I once did. Or I want to do this new evil that I see just across the table from me. Okay? Paul lives in this reality. Paul understands. Okay? And, and we, we, under, we ought to understand that as well. So long as we have life and breath here on this earth, there's that aspect in each and every one of us that our flesh is going to want to try to resurrect itself into our lives. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, we're saying, no, I am dead to myself, but I'm alive in Jesus Christ. I'm going to let Christ live in me, not Dan Johnson. So Paul brings out that aspect of, of the world in which we live. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Going back to that verse 3, point number 1, we are in a war. You realize that? We are in a war. Here in America, here in America 
we struggle with that idea because we're in peace, right? I mean, who, who's really attacking us? Do we feel? Do we, did you wake up feeling attacked? Turn on the news, then you feel, yeah, I think we'll be attacked here, right? But the point of the matter is, is, is Paul is telling us the reality. We are in a war. We have been called to engage in that war. What does that uh, war consist of? Well, it's a battle for life and death. For those that call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive life. We're on the victorious side. Okay? We live, are meant to live a victorious life. Okay? Bringing glory, honor, praise unto God. Living holy, righteous unto God as best we can. Where we get it wrong, where we step in it, so to speak, where we do sin, as soon as we're convicted, as soon as the Spirit comes upon us, we say, God, that was me. Forgive me. And we cast that out and we press on. We don't sit there and, and stew in it. We just say, Lord, yes, that was me. I ask for forgiveness. If I need to ask people's forgiveness, point to those that I need to go seek out. Go seek out their forgiveness. It's amazing what forgiveness does. Particularly, well, on both ends of it. On both ends of it. When we go to ask for forgiveness, boy, what a lowly of humility that requires, right? How many here place to admit they're wrong? None of us, right? I'm right. <laughs> okay? Nobody wants to admit that we're wrong. But for you to go to look the person in the eye and say, you know what, I was wrong in that. And I have no excuse for it. I just, I, I want to ask your forgiveness. And look, still look him in the eye and say, and I'm going to do my utmost never to do that again. Will you please forgive me? What humility, huh? Now, go to the other side of it. To extend forgiveness. When we extend forgiveness the way Christ extends forgiveness, right? Think of the humility that comes out of that. I have a right to beat you down for what you just did. <laughs> you wronged me so deep. But in this battle, the spiritual battle, there is one of those battles we step into. Can I forgive that person? When I forgive, when you forgive, we release this burden that's upon them. It, it's not for their salvation, but it's for a reconciliation of re relationship. We release this burden, this guilt that is upon them. We're saying, I'm not going to hold that against you. I forgive you. Yeah, don't do it again. I appreciate that, but I forgive you. There's humility on both sides of that equation. It's that battle of life and death, uh, this war that we're in. It's the eternal life or it's damnation. We're battling for people's lives for an eternity. Right? Or is it just to say I'm right? A lot of times, I, well, I won't say a lot of times. I've got to be careful of the words I use. There's times when we can beat somebody with the truth and yet drive them away from the truth. Right? But it was true, God. It was true. You're right. But they didn't hear the truth. All they saw was an angry young man barking out, blah, 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 blah. They didn't feel the love of Christ. They didn't experience the peace of Christ. They didn't experience that, that forgiveness that I received. I'm not extending it to them. That's part of the battle. That's part of the battle. Do we, have you ever stopped to think about this? How many, again, how many woke up thinking you're in a battle today? Okay, fair enough, Les. <laughs> but we are in a battle, and Paul is calling us to this. He's reminding the Corinthian church, he's reminding us of it. It's with Satan and the demons, okay? We are in a battle with Satan and the demons. Now, maybe not Satan in particular, okay? Or, and, and uh, you know, um, maybe not 
a manifestation of a demon? Have you ever experienced? But the point of the matter is, when we pray, when we pray up here, it's not just up here. We're doing the battle up here in the heavens. We're going into the, the, the presence of God saying, Lord, this individual is requesting healing. This individual is requesting peace. This individual is requesting, Lord, we stand with them. Lord, would you, would you act upon their life? Uh, the, the, the person that, that, is, that has been so conflicted that they feel so bound and tightened down by the stresses, anxieties, or whatever in, in life, they ask for prayer. It's not just to give them a warm, fuzzy feeling. When we begin to pray, the minute we say, Father in heaven, we come to you, or even say, Jesus, we engage in that spiritual realm. They're not just words. It's an engagement in the spiritual realm. And again, just to remind us that this battle is for people's lives. Jesus won the victory, right? I mean, he just, we know we're on the winning side. Praise the Lord. Amen. And yet, <laughs> in our lives, there's going to be battles after battle after battle after battle. Ours is just to be called into battle. The outcome is the Lord's. The outcome is the Lord's. But it's about people. It's about uh, uh, life and death. It's about eternity. This war that we are engaged in. It is a spiritual battle. Not just physical. Verse 4. Point number 2. We are afforded weapons. We are afforded weapons. We are given weapons in our spiritual life that when we come to the altar and there's prayer being made, there, that is a weapon that we are utilizing. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, if you go there, that's the, the wonderful passage that Paul writes about the armor of God, right? The, the helmet of salvation, right? And, and you can correct me as I go through these. Breastplate of righteousness. The belt of truth. The sword of the Spirit, right? The Word of God. The shield of faith. And our feet shod with what? Gospel of peace. Okay? Each one of these, it's a weapon. Did I forget one? I see some YouTube part now. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I always get nervous like that. I forget one. Okay? But these are, yes, yeah, some are defensive, some are offensive. But at the, but at the end of the day, they're all offensive. They're all offensive. The belt of truth. Have you ever shared truth with somebody? You know you're right. And you're sharing it in humility. And yet they slap you in the face and say, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> the belt's just holding my pants up. No, the belt is girded around my waist, holding the truth in me. The truth is offensive. Your faith can be offensive. I believe God can do this. Oh, you don't know, blah, blah, blah. You have this butting of heads. Why? It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. We see that, uh, that in Ephesians 6, uh, Daniel 10, verses 7 through 21, and I'm not going to get into the prophecy of what's, what's going on here, but I do want to read this, that the spiritual battle has been uh, long going on from the very beginning. You can go back to the creation where Satan began to, to come against. 7 through 21, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pick, pick what I'm going to read here, but beginning in uh, verse 7, and I, Daniel, alone saw this vision, for the, the men who were with me did not see the vision. 
But a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone. Again, he's taken into this spiritual realm, into this vision that he had. When I saw this great vision, no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I now have been sent to you. While he was speaking the, these words to me, I stood trembling. Then he said, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God. When did this start? The first day he humbled his heart and set his life before God. Your words were heard. Isn't that good news? God hears our words. Now, having said that, I do want to say that in first, I think it's first Peter that um, it's important in, if you're in a marriage relationship that if you're having a bad day with your wife and you're offering up prayers, there's a hindrance there. Peter writes of this, right? So that's why it's important, gentlemen and wives, have a good marriage. I didn't say a perfect marriage. The only perfect marriage I know is the one I am with Jesus Christ. Because he's perfect. And he helps me along. <laughs> okay? But to be in a good relationship, the help in, in that marriage relationship helps our, our prayer. Uh, finishing out verse 12. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of, per kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the la latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. And again, it goes down and refers to this, this angel in this vision, this, this person in the heavenlies coming to Daniel and explaining what his vision was. But did you hear what, what took place? The kings, the rulers over the area of Persia uh, held up this messenger of God that was meant to get to Daniel sooner. But it wasn't until Michael the archangel came and began the battle that it freed up this messenger to go. Is this just silliness? Absolutely not. I believe that's how it operates. When we pray, we engage God's messengers to do God's will. We engage in that. We are in that battle, right? And we've been given weapons to engage in. Jesus, uh, just, to, just to let us know, Jesus, he dealt with uh, demons, he placed them in the pigs, you remember that, they ran over the cliff, uh, Jesus being the complete authority, we know that uh, uh, that Jesus' name, demons must flee, okay, when we proclaim that, demons must flee, uh, having said that, if you remember the sons of Sceva in Acts, uh, in the book of Acts, I can't remember the chapter right offhand, but there were seven of them, they went in to deal with this demon possession, one person holding this demon possession, they walk into the situation thinking, hey, we can do this. They got the stock kicked out of them. Their clothes taken. Okay, I don't know to what depth they, their clothes were taken, but it does say that they ran naked through the streets. Okay, take where you want it. Point being is one individual possessed by a demon took care of seven individuals. They went in not in the right spirit, not in the right attitude, not in the right frame of manner in which they ought to. We need to respect, you know, yes, we have the authority over demons, but we respect. We show a respect for the angels. We show a respect for demons. We don't worship 
We worship only one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we worship. In Mark uh, chapter 9, uh, Jesus uh, healed uh, this uh, an individual, and the disciple says, well, why couldn't we do it? We tried, we couldn't do it. What's the deal? He says, well, with this one, with this situation, it comes, it comes out by fasting and prayer. So prayer is one of our weapons. Fasting is a weapon. It's not just to change your weight. <laughs> no, fasting is meant is a spiritual thing that we do. It's a spiritual practice that we've been given to do. So we are afforded weapons. The question is, is, are we practicing in our armor? Daily. I struggle with it at times. I get sidetracked with other things. I get caught up in the daily dialogue of, you know, um, you know the, the idea of economics, that that's going to save our country. The, the one guy that can lead us into a good economic recovery, that's going to save America. I don't think so. I don't think so. Sure, they might be great ideas, but no nation stands that rejects God. No nation stands that rejects God. Getting ahead of myself. That would be closer in November. Um, <laughs> but are we practicing living in this arm? Living with this, with these weapons and these defensive mechanisms uh, upon our lives? Are we acting in faith? Are we acting? Uh, knowing, do you, do you truly believe you're saved? Do you live like you're a saved individual? I hope so. Paul's calling us to that. So number one, we are in a war. Number two, we are afforded weapons. And finally, we are to recognize the real battle. Okay? It's for the pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, Okay? How many of you have gotten into a political argument? <laughs> How many enjoy it? <laughs> right? No, but, it, but we, we always need to. Politically, religiously, uh, whatever, economically, we need to come back to the truth. We need to come back to the truth. What is the truth? Politically, government was established by God. That's truth. Politically, government is meant to know what truth is and abide within the truth. Not creating their own, not establishing their own. You can go back in the Old Testament. Remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, right? <laughs> Looked out over all his kingdom and says, look what I created. And in an instant, he was on all fours running around like a madman. It wasn't until he came to his senses that he said, you know what? God, you established this. The one true God has established this. As soon as he said that, his sense was given back to him. He was reestablished as the king. I, I think that's a powerful story. I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in heaven or not. I kind of hope he is. Well, I do hope he is. You know, I don't kind of. I hope he is. But the scripture doesn't really say, you know, where his heart was the rest of his life. Okay? But I think it's such a beautiful thing that even God using the wicked king to step into their life when they cry out and say, God, forgive me for having such an attitude. God steps in. Again, that just shows the, the, the beauty of God. But it's uh, talking about pulling down the strongholds, these, these areas of influence. Um, I do believe, I do think that regionally and locally um, that there's the reality of a satanic presence over these areas. Okay, so Satan, Satan's an organizer. 
He knows how to do battle. He sets up, okay? And so when's the last time we prayed against that, that stronghold over Motley? That stronghold over Pillager? That stronghold over May Township? That stronghold over Baxter, Brainerd? When, when's the last time we thought in those terms? See, our prayers, when we begin to do this battle, there's a weakening of those strongholds. It may not seem like it at times, but there's a weakening when we do that battle. When we pray for our nation's leaders, in part, what we're doing is saying, God, that stronghold over Washington, D.C., we pray for it to be broken down. That the presence of Satan's deceit and deception be gone. God's plan and purpose, I, you know, we can get into that. But the point of the matter is, when's the last time you prayed against those strongholds? So God, there is a spirit over this land. There's a spirit over this town. Um, and, it could, and it also went into your own homes. Uh, years back, yeah, we're not a time frame. We're in eternity. Okay. Um, years back, uh, uh, Karen's brother and his wife, um, they, they just started having these physical issues in their life. They lived in an apartment and, and that. It was just kind of an ongoing process. And finally, and, and it's, well, I shouldn't say finally, at some point they said, what else could it be if, if there's really, the doctors can't find anything wrong with me? What's going on? And so uh, a friend of theirs said, well, look around your house and tell me when these, tell, you know, remind yourself when this started and what was taken into your home at the time. What? Oh, I got a new car. That's not it. What they narrowed it down to was in their bedroom, over their bed, was this picture, I think it was a picture of roses, just simple roses. They said, that's it. Took it off the wall, got rid of it, trust it, threw it away, okay? But they got it out of their home. You know what happened to them physically? They were better. Ah, coincidence, right? No, no. More personal note, I've shared this numerous times. <laughs> I'm gonna throw the, uh, the pastor under the bus. No. Um, we were told that this, that there was a film out there that everybody should watch. It's such a great twist at the end. It's so awesome, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, my pastor was saying this and other uh, people that I trust as, as followers of Christ, they were saying, yeah, no, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a pretty good film. So Karen and I watch it. Um, I, I don't know exactly when we started. Probably eight o'clock after we put our kids to bed because they shouldn't watch those things. Um, so we're watching this, and at the end of the film, there there's a, there is a twist in it. Uh, uh, spoiler alert: it's the sixth sense. And as we walk, worked through it, came to the end, we realized. <laughs> And, and I'm, this isn't a, a blanket statement on anybody. This is a conviction for Karen and I. I do think it's true for everyone, but for us, we both had this fear in our heart that, Lord God, we just opened a window. We opened a window for a demon to come into our home, not into our lives. We opened, we just opened this window, Watch and say, whoa, wait a minute, what is this? And, and I praise God for that conviction. And I praise God that, that both Karen and I agree we need to, you rewound in those days. If, be kind, rewind. <laughs> so we did the godly thing, we rewound. But I drove it back to the video place, put it in there, it wasn't mine to destroy, so I gave it back. Okay, we, I come back to the home for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> We're doing battle. 
We're asking God's forgiveness for allowing this into our home. We're asking God's protection about whatever is in here to be gone. And Father God, that you would hold up those wall, the, the holes in the walls, that you would you know, place covering over those holes permanently, that they, don't, they can't come in again. I think that I, I, I truly believe this. Entertainment is one of those windows that we open up. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear, right? Be careful what we watch. And, and that's not just in film. That's, you know, if you listen to talk radio 100% of the time, pay attention to the language you use, the verbiage you say. It, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And I, I do listen to talk radio, so I'm not saying don't ever listen. I'm saying any avenue is an opportunity for Satan, a demonic hold on your life. Again, don't look for a demon around every little corner and every little bush. But have a heart that says, God, what I just heard and saw, is this of you? If it's not of you, Father, forgive me for putting it in my brain. Cast it out in Jesus' name. We need to recognize that battle. It's pulling down the strongholds. It's casting down arguments that are deceptive. We bring the truth and we leave it there for them. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. We can say it all day long, but until they take the time to ponder that truth, it's not up to us. It's us to bring the truth. Here it is. Take and think about it. And everything, uh, every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Okay? Everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Again, we need to be able to recognize what those things are. And take a stand and say, no, you've gone too far. We're not going there anymore. Great example, beautiful example. And I'm not about to close. This is important. I think we have, we've been reckless with this. Why did it take five shot put throwers in South Carolina to take a stand against transgender uh, athletes? Church fell asleep. The church allowed this truth to be left unchallenged. They tore down this truth of there is a male, there is a female, there is a difference between the two. I don't think they should compete together. Ever. <laughs> but you can talk to me about that later. Okay? The point being is, it took five female shot put throwers to walk into that ring because their name was called and they had to step in, walked in, and walked out illegally. Didn't throw. They were, they, they gained a foul, they gained a foul, five. Now the officials had to step in, I don't know how, what they did after that. Why, why do we, why, you know, why do we want the younger generation to, to fix it? We that are walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be on the forefront, amen? Amen. amen. And, and doing it in the, the humbleness and the, the gentleness of God, but also or of Christ, but also in the boldness of Christ. There's that, there, there's that balance that's there. And then finally, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Okay? You remember in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, right? That it's, it's wrong to commit murder, right? What did Jesus hype it to? It's wrong to hate your brother. To have that thought, you've already committed murder. Whoa! Talk about the level of obedience that, that Paul is calling us to. I think you've heard numerous times, uh, myself, Lord God, captivate our minds and our hearts today as we worship you. 
my prayer for myself, it's my prayer for the body of believers as we come together, that I'm not concerned about uh, that board meeting next week or that track meet that I'm, I'm going to be attending, okay? No, here now, God, help me captivate my mind before you. Thank you, Jesus. When I get to that board meeting, Lord, captivate my heart and my mind that I speak well. That what I say honors and glorifies you. So how well are we engaged in this war? Are we alert? Are we inconvenienced by the war, by the battle? The battle is for your life. The battle is for other people's lives. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is that victor. The battle is for believers to be engaged in. The effort in ever-increasing intent and determination. The battle is for the believer to be engaged in, uh, excuse me, to be engaged in the effort in an ever-increasing intent and determination. If you know Jesus and you've been walking with Jesus any amount of time, your faith should be greater than that first faith that brought you into relationship with Jesus Christ. If it's still, no, Jesus saves me. That's where I'm at. Paul is calling you. I'm telling you, Christ is calling you. I'm telling you, the body of Christ is saying, mature. Grow in your faith. Grow in your faith. ever intentional and let it be ever increasing that intent and the determination by the power of the Holy Spirit yes a believer follower of Jesus Christ fellow saint however you want me to refer to you as okay are you ever growing in your faith or are you comfortable no I'm good right where I'm at when the hardships come, do you go to Christ right away or do you try to figure these things out on your own? And that, I praise God for hardship. Not that I want any God. <laughs> I got good life, thank you. Health hardship, financial hardship, physical hardship, whatever hardship. It ought to drive us back to God saying, God, I need you all the more today. Fill me up. Fill me up. When Paul was talking about a war that we're in. Do we realize it? Are we weaponized for it? Are we recognizing it? Saints of God, that's on you. Take that before God and say, God, is this me? Am I ready? Am I doing? What more should I do? Or am I sitting right when I need you? God, is there a peace in my heart? Thank you, Father. I'm going to live in that. But it's for the life of every person. Jesus came to save lives. Jesus came, died on the cross, went to the grave, resurrected, ascended into heaven for the purpose of coming back for all those that believe in him. When we ask Jesus into our life, when we say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life, you're my Savior, what I'm saying to him is, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need your help. Save me. Jesus saves me. Jesus saves you. If that's you, call on Jesus today. Don't stay in your seat after the service. Meander your way up. Nonchalantly. Cool. Collected. Come up here and just let me know or let another person that's up here know that you gave your heart to the Lord today. I want to rejoice with you. I want to speak life into your life. I want to pray with you. Because that's what we're about. Seeing people come into salvation with Jesus Christ, people grow in their faith in Jesus Christ. That we can exalt God better. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we close this time together, I thank you for uh, this family that we could celebrate. Lord, the baby dedications. Lord, for uh, Leanna May, we raise her up to you for your blessing, your anointing, your presence upon her life that she grows to know you at an early age. 
father for Coulter John. That young man with a great voice <laughs> touched his life. Cause him to become the man of God that you've created him to be. Father, so the men and women give their heart to you this morning. Lord, let them not shrink back. Help them to step forward and make that proclamation to somebody today. Help them to grow in their faith. Father, for your saints, for the body of believers, for the church uh, of, the, of the, the body of Christ, Lord, help us to realize that we're in this war, that you have given us the weapons to battle. Lord, help us to recognize these battles. Help us to do this battle. You're good. You're beautiful, God. Thank you for this time together as we leave now, Lord, uh, from this place. We now go do the service you called us to. To your glory and honor, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on out tonight. Patty Horns.